So today we're going to revisit propagation of uncertainty. And I think this is probably the third time some of you have seen it. You saw some of it in quant, in PKIM 1. And so it, typically, if I'm learning a new skill, the third time I'm exposed to it, then it really locks in. So let yourself get it. If this is one of those things that you said, oh, I hate this, I'll never get it, it doesn't make any sense to me, uh, don't, don't talk yourself down. I mean, self-talk is an important part of learning, and you need to cut it off at the pass when you're telling yourself you can't get something that's a problem. And so let yourself get it. And uh, this morning, I think it'll be very clear, especially when we tie it to a calibration example. Uh, in the past, I've done the calibration example on the board. My handwriting on the board is, is not as good as if I use the equation editor in PowerPoint. And so there's some changes. If you downloaded the slides uh, before last night, then you don't have this, but that's okay. Do it in your notebook. I go step by step through the example for a calibration line. And then it'll also be on the video, and you can go back and review it. Okay. And so let's get started. So for propagation of uncertainty, you know, we, we want to make sure, and it'll be evident today, why we want to propagate uncertainty. Every, every measurement has some uncertainty associated with it. And giving someone a number without an estimate of the uncertainty is giving them limited information. That's that third question for analytical chemistry. What are the first two? What, think, what? think of the two words, qual and quant, right? Anal qualitative analysis is, what is it? Quantitative analysis is, how much is there? And then the third question is, how sure are you? So this is related to that surety or trust you give somebody a number and they see your precision. And you also need to give them maybe a report that shows when you work against a known standard, you're accurate. So precision and accuracy are not the same thing. You can be very precisely wrong. <laughs> okay. So you need to show both. You say, yes, I'm a very, very precise techniques and instrumentation. But also when I work against an, a, a known sample, I get the correct answer. <clears throat> So directly measured quantities, you measure something three times, you take the standard deviation, you can measure your uncertainty directly on that one measurement. But when you combine these measurements, that's when you have to use propagation of uncertainty. And so these multiple measurements and dilutions and so on, you're pretty far down the road when you get that last number. And it's, uh, it's got all of those other uncertainties mixed in. Now, even then, if you if you done your dilutions, you run it on an instrument, you get your result. That whole chain can be summed up by just repeating the, the total measurement three times and taking the standard deviation. So you've captured all of that uncertainty in that last end result. And if you average that, then you get your standard deviation. And that incorporates all the uncertainties up to that point. But what if you use that point in part of a calibration? And then you have another three measurements, and that's another concentration, and another three measurements. So now you've got three measurements, uh, different concentrations, all on a line. And how do you then propagate the uncertainty? That's what we're going to answer today, is how to use this in relationship to a calibration uh, uh, experiment. And so these are the equations that we'll use, this propagation of uncertainty table that we've used for going on now a whole year. Okay. And the simplified versions are shown here on the right for sums and for products and for exponents. And so let's use an example. Let's say we had a piece of evidence that was a, was a metal chunk and we weighed it. It was 2.5 grams and we displaced water. So we put it in a graduated cylinder and measured the volume change. And so now we have mass, now we have volume. We can look up the metal in a density table and find out what the knowns are. And so we see that this, uh, this, there's some knowns on there. We think it might be gold or it might be tungsten. And those are two very close together metals in terms of density. The density comes out. We're going to keep all of these digits as guard digits. So when we calculate our results, before we calculate the uncertainty, we want to keep all of those digits and just hold on to them. Uh, but then the question is, can you tell if this is gold, 19.28, or tungsten, 19.25? You really don't know at this point. Okay? You look at it and you say, well, it comes in at 19.25 if I were to round to the hundreds. So it should be tungsten. But I'm going to show you what the uncertainty in this measurement does for your confidence. And it destroys it, really. Okay? 
Okay. So this is a multiplication division problem. And so we would use that uh, second row in that table where you have the, the squared uh, sum of the relative standard deviations of each of the pieces. And so this is that equation from that table. Um, the uncertainty in our measurement is the measurement times the square root of the relative standard deviations of the pieces in the division that we have. So this is the RSD for mass. You see here, this is the uncertainty in mass divided by the mass. And where do we get that? We get that from the problem. So we must have weighed this thing two or three times to get our standard deviation. And that was our standard deviation. And so it's this uncertainty divided by the value. That's our relative standard deviation for the first piece. And then the second piece is our volume. 0.05 mils divided by 0.13 mils. Now you can look at this before we go any further and see what is the largest source of our uncertainty. And if we have two measurements, which of them is, is worse in terms of our uncertainty? And so a real simple way to do this is to look at those fractions, right? The fractions are going to be squared, added together, and then take the square root. So we're going to get the square and the square root kind of cancel each other out. So just look at those fractions. Those fractions are going to give us a fractional uncertainty in our result. So which is the biggest fraction? And our two choices are volume or mass. So which of those two fractions, the, va the mass fraction or the volume fraction, are the largest fractions? So here, mixed results. Let's look at this and remember we, we can just use our hand to cover up the digits. And that's 2 out of 25. So that's two twenty-fifths, right? And this is five thirteenths. Which is larger? Five thirteenths is a larger fraction. Okay. So just right here, I can look and say, gee, in this experiment, uh, I've got a problem with my volume measurement. It's not precise enough. This is going to give me problems because I'm not going to know. I mean, what is five thirteenths? That's, that's almost a half, right? Five tenths would be a half. Okay, so that means I'm 50-50, a 50% 50 error. You know, of, of, the, of the 0 0.13 mils, 0 0.05 of that is uncertain. That's a real problem. Okay. So let's go ahead and go back to the math. So, so we, we do these ratios, we square them, add them together, take the square root, and multiply by the 19.25, et cetera, and we get 7.6 grams per mil, okay? And so this is what we would report. Our density, see now we use this number to round our result. Mm -hmm. So this tells us now where to round. Remember you keep one, all the certain digits plus one or two uncertain digits. And so we'll just keep two in this case. We have 7.6, that comes over here, and that tells me I need to round this really long number to the tenths place, so that the place values match. This goes to the tenths, and so this one's going to go to the tenths. So you wait until you get your uncertainty value to tell you where to round. Okay. And so let me go ahead and put that on the, the video here with the pen. So this tenths place tells you where to round your density value. So those should match. You could have just as well written the density is 19 plus or minus 8, and that would be acceptable. But is it, they have to round at the same place, okay? Saying 19.3 plus or minus 8 is not acceptable. Why? The place values don't match. And the same as saying this is 19, the density 19 plus or minus 7.6, that's not correct either because the place values don't match. Your, your rounding has to match place values. Now, why wouldn't it match to say uh, 19.25 uh, plus or minus 7 point, say 63, whatever that third digit is in the uncertainty? The place values match in that case. But now you're keeping three uncertain digits. And that's 
it's, I've never seen three. I've seen two and I've seen one. Uh, one is the convention. They say keep all the certain digits plus one uncertain digit. But I've seen often in the literature two. But I, three is ridiculous. So two is fine. I like to use two uncertain digits. Okay, but, but the third digit is really unfounded. If you're, again, think of, of money. I don't know whether I have 100, 200, uh, you know, I said say three. I don't know, I've got $300 plus or minus 100, okay? So I might have $400, I might have $300, and you're asking me to estimate how many single dollars I have, ones. I don't know how many ones I have, because I don't know if I have 400, 300, or 200. Okay. So the third uncertain digit is ridiculous. You wouldn't keep that. I know for court it has to do with 95% confidence. Okay, we'll get to confidence intervals today. So right now we're just showing with standard deviation, but that's a great thing to point out. So this is this would be our standard deviation. And this is one way to report it. So this would be, if you were to report this, you might have to say, um, all right, say using using S, okay? So that you're, you're saying, I'm using my standard deviation in this reported value. Um, or you might say plus or minus 1s, where this 7.6 is plus or minus 1s, one standard deviation. Now we'll learn in a second when we get to the population or the Gaussian distribution that this is plus or minus, um, it's like 63% confidence interval using plus or minus 1s. And that may not be good enough. Okay. So this is just a graphical view of our relative standard deviations. And so this is the width of our volume measurement. Our mass measurement's narrower. You see that? So we have 0.38 is our relative standard deviation for volume. 0.09 is our relative standard deviation for mass. And so when these combine, this gives our combined relative standard deviation of 0.39. You see how that 0.39 is very close to the 0.38 of volume? So that's telling us volumes dominating our uncertainty. If we could narrow up that, that volume measurement, get a better graduated cylinder or whatever it was we used to measure the volume, then we would improve this experiment and we might be able to tell what kind of metal it is. Let's look at the results though. Um, it is, uh, our, our value was 19.25, which was the density of tungsten. So that would, that's what we would call the center of our distribution. That would be our most probable result. But look how, f because our distribution is so wide, look how flat the top is. See how flat the top is? That means tungsten and gold essentially have the same probability. And, and these metals nearby also, about the same probability. And in fact, this green bar right here, from this to this, is the width of the 50% confidence width. So this area under the curve equals this area plus this area. <laughs> so we're saying if I want to add plus or minus values to, to grab 50% of this probability curve, this curve, the area under that curve is equal to 1. And so any fraction of that area is going to be the probability. So this fractional area in the middle of that green line, that's 50% probability. And so these are the metals that, that it could be at 50% confidence. It's not a great result. I say, well, it could be tungsten, but it could be rhenium or platinum, osmium, iridium, or tantalum. Okay, uh, It's either those metals or it's not, 50-50. <laughs> okay. So that is not great confidence. So if you want 95% confidence, you're going to spread your, your um, area out. And so this purple line captures 95% of the area under this curve. And these are the metals that that captures. So your 95% confidence, it's one of these metals. <laughs> right? Probably not enough to convict. <laughs> Unless... Unless they did something, let's say the piece of evidence was over here and it was ma magnesium. So I don't know how they used magnesium as a weapon, but let's say they did and you have this piece of metal on their clothing and you say, ah, oh, was this a piece of metal from, from the 
the murder weapon, this magnesium instrument, you're 95% confidence it's not magnesium. <laughs> it's just good enough, right? Do you know what it was? No. Because <laughs> it could be any one of those things. But you know it's not magnesium, which is maybe enough. So even with this junky procedure that we have, with the crummy volume measurement, it's not worthless. If you, if you look at the data and you say, well, magnesium is such a, a low density metal, and our measurement said this at 19.25 grams per mil, that's pretty dense, it's not magnesium. I can't tell you what it is confidently, but I can say there's less than a 2.5% chance that it's magnesium. Now, where did I get that part? That's the claim. Yeah, so this is two and a half percent over here. At that mark and above, that's two per two and a half percent. And this over here is two and a half percent. Well, there aren't any any metals over there. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay, so there's less than a two and a half percent chance that this metal is magnesium okay and so you could say confidently well that metal didn't come from the from the murder weapon okay that little particle i don't know how you measure the density of a small particle but this is a hypothetical so that's the confidence intervals and the use of them and say so, but yeah the math math worked out where it's most probably tungsten but but you, you just don't know with your uncertainty. You can't say anything. You know, there are no yabbits. So let's look at a calibration example. This is extremely relevant to your work in science because you've, you've done calibration curves. We even have now in the Chem 2 lab, I mean, you do a little calibration curve with the SPEC 20 and you measure an unknown, et cetera. And so let's say you have uh, cocaine samples. You run these standards at certain parts per billion cocaine run them through a, a gas chromatograph, and you integrate the, the peak areas. And so these are area counts on your detector. And so you have this many counts um, for each of your standards, and you get a very nice linear fit. I mean, the, the R-squared value is 9 0.9994. <clears throat> now, a way to interpret the R-squared value on one of these is that it, cap it tells you the percentage of the scatter in the data that's captured by your model. So you may want to write that down. R squared, R squared is the percentage of the scatter in your data that's captured by your model. I'll say it again. R squared is the percentage of the scatter in your data that's captured by the model. So what's the scatter in our data? It's the, the fact that the data points are not the same. If they're straight on a straight line across, it doesn't matter what parts per billion cocaine you have, there's no scatter in the data, right? You get the same answer no matter what you inject. Okay, so the fact that they're different is scatter in the data. Okay. Now if it's random, it's not captured by your linear model. If it's linear, then it can't be captured by your linear model. And so we're capturing 99.94% of the change in the data with a simple line. So we have a linear fit, and it, that linear fit is capturing 99.94% of the, of the scatter. Okay. That's very good. And so we now have a, we have calibrated our instrument. If we come in now with some unknown values, we measure Y now with some, some unknowns. We put in sample and we get area counts. And we're going to then run this sort of backwards. We're going to take the Y values and determine what the three X values are for each of those. Okay. <clears throat> Notice that the width of those yellow bars is not the same. And that's the need for propagation of uncertainty. You can't just do the standard deviation in the y values and then just put it on x. Because y and x aren't the same thing. So we have to propagate our uncertainty. We have to take that yellow bar across to the line and then down to the x. And we've got to propagate the uncertainty to tell us what our uncertainty is in parts per billion. We, we can calculate the standard deviation in our y values. 
we got three area counts, we take the average, we take the standard deviation, and so we know what our uncertainty is in Y. But what's the uncertainty in X? And so this trend line is not enough. It's useful to tell us the R-squared value, but it lacks uncertainty estimates. And so in order to get the plus or minus on M and the plus or minus on B, we have to do the ANOVA. And we did this in, in Excel last semester. We always did the, the linear regression, which gives us the same answers, but more information. So here's the ANOVA table that we do. So if we take this data, we have the X values for our calibration and the Y values for our calibration, and we run a linear regression on it, we get this table. We get the same R squared value, that's comforting. <laughs> okay, so that tells us the trend line is giving us, you know, we have the same, you know, parameters selected. But down here we have M and B. So this is, the intercept is B, and the other value is M. I can't get it because of the little tools. Okay, I'll say M is right there. <laughs> okay. And then this column is the standard error or standard deviation or S. And so now we can write this calibration equation with the uncertainties in it. So we have M here and SM and B and SB. So when we're looking at the propagation of uncertainty, then we, we have our variables defined. Okay. And so let's just go through and define all of our variables. There's our calibration equation up there. And so if we're given a, a Y value plus or minus SY, we can determine what X is. How do we find the uncertainty in X? So M from our equation is 416.6. Let's go ahead and include the units so that we can see how all the units work out through the propagation of uncertainty. That's area counts per parts per billion. So that's that slope. You give it a parts per billion and it converts it to area counts. Okay. You see that in the equation? You put in an X, X is in parts per billion, and this M value converts it to the Y value, which is area counts. Then SM is its uncertainty. It came from the ANOVA table. B is 1214, and the uncertainty there is, is 120 parts per billion. So keeping track of the units. Um, oh, no. These units are wrong. Just caught my error. So these are area counts. Look at the equation. Parts per billion wouldn't make sense. Okay. And so then we ran three check samples. So these are our uh, three, when I say check sample, it's a sample that we know the concentration is. So we run these samples. We say that there are 125 part per billion cocaine samples. So we prepared three of those and ran them on our instrument, our calibrated instrument, and we should get 125 parts per billion after we, so this is the area counts for 125 parts per billion check sample. And we're kind of testing our, our calibration. Do we get the right answer? So we know that these are 125. We run them on our instrument and see what the answer is that comes out of our calibration curve. And then we can test our accuracy. Okay. Then we'll do more with this same kind of experiment later. Le today, let's just focus on the propagation of uncertainty. So from these three runs here, we can get our average and standard deviation. So this would be Y here and SY. So those numbers are Y is uh, 55,333 area counts, and then the uncertainty in that is uh, 1,528 area counts. So this is everything that we know. All of our values and their uncertainties. And so what we're looking for is the uncertainty in X. But we can calculate X using this equation. So what is X? This is always simple. It's just like calculating the density in the previous example. We can just take mass over volume. In this case, we invert this linear equation, right? Y equals MX plus B. I've now got a Y value. I don't know what X is. So let's just invert this, right? Subtract B from both sides and divide both sides by M. And you've isolated X on one side of the equation, OK? If this bothers you, come visit with me. We'll go over algebra. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
just do a little algebra here. And so we take y minus b divided by m, and we get x is 129.9 parts per billion. Dang it. We failed. We didn't get 125. Right? We put in a 125 check sample, and we got 129.9. How could we be so wrong? Uh, earlier on the ENOVA table, you it's, had a uh, value of 0.4 for your um, yeah, yeah. intercept. Yes, yeah, it's not valid, yeah. So we'll, we'll that's the next two lectures from now. <laughs> 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 but that's great. In fact, let's stop for a second. Um, you know, I want to treat y'all like adults. Y'all are adults, you know, this is great. And, and I don't want to be like an elementary school teacher teaching college, right? Uh, but then I was watching the like the football game was I think it was Ohio State, um, one of their playoff games, and I noticed on the back of their helmets, what do they have? Like when a like when a when a defensive back really just trashes a receiver, um, and the coach is impressed, what does he get on his helmet? Little Buckeye sticker, right? And I thought that's good enough for these big burly football guys. And so I went ahead right then and on my phone ordered some, <laughs> some stickers. Okay, let me, let me get this on the film here. <laughs> I got some little science stickers here. So when somebody does like a knockback, like a, if someone's digging through an ANOVA table that fast and looks at the p-value and says, hey, that intercept is pretty crappy, they get a sticker. <laughs> now, we don't have helmets in here, okay, but you have a notebook or something like that, so you can pick one. We've got a little Adam or something like that. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so um, you know, don't feel like I'm treating you like elementary school kids, but everybody likes a little everybody something, likes right? And so you, you can put them on your yeah, laptop or whatever or your, your notebook, and you get to pick. So good job. we got a sticker for finding that p-value and uh, <laughs> foreshadowing what we're going to do in a couple of yeah, so everybody strive to get your stickers, you know, because, you know, you see the helmets and you, like, the really brutal players have, you know, Buckeyes all over their helmets, and so it's kind of fun. So this is not quite as violent in chemistry, but uh, still just as enjoyable for me, at least. Okay, so we had this 129.9, and, and it does seem like it's off from the check sample of 125, okay? Um, but should we be worried about that? Well... Let's see if our, if our confidence interval includes the 125, right? Because we may say, all right, at 95% confidence, it still captures what we thought the right answer was. And so the 125 may still be within our confidence limits. So we shouldn't panic yet. We've got uh, an answer that's, you know, a few points off. It's, it's four parts per billion off. And, and, you know, should we worry about that or not? We'll see. So what is the uncertainty in X? This is the propagation of uncertainty part. Okay. So I've got the same values, just smaller, up on the left, so that you can kind of refer back to them as we do the problem. And so we have this, this equation for X. Let me just make sure that the video is not screwing things up. So, yeah, we're good. So we have this equation for x, and it, it is a mixed situation, right? We have that table that has addition and subtraction and <coughs> multiplication and division, and here's an equation that has both, okay? So we have subtraction in the numerator, and then we have division in the whole result. And we've got to do the propagation of uncertainty in the same order that we would do the operation. So if you put this in your calculator, what are you going to do? You're going to do the, the subtraction first, and then you're going to divide. Do the uncertainty the same way. Calculate the uncertainty for the numerator first, and then do the division piece. So we're going to have a new variable that we don't have in any of our equations. We're just going to have a variable called numerator. Okay, so what is the numerator? It's just y minus b. So calculate that. 5, 5, 3, 3, 3, minus 12, 14. That's 5, 4, 54, 1, 1, 9. So that's the value of the numerator. And we can get the uncertainty for the numerator because we're going to have to use the RSD for the numerator. Okay, so then this is the uncertainty for the numerator. The square root of the uncertainty in Y and in B. We know those values from over, you know, in our data. We have SY and we have SB. So we have this uh, 1,532 counts 
is our uncertainty in the numerator. So this should be pretty easy to keep track of now. I know that uh, we've had these examples. We had a few of them in PCHEM as well, but people had trouble with that. Plus, there was just a whole lot more going on in those labs. So this is just isolated to one calibration example. So now that we know the S for the numerator and the numerator, we can do the division piece. So this is a, a division piece, so we have a different equation for the uncertainty. Uh, S of X is uh, X times the square root of the RSDs squared. And so the, the numerator, this is the RSD for the numerator, which we had to then, cal we had to calculate using these, these new terms over here. And then this is the RSD for, for M, for the slope. And then here's our X value. So that gives us our uncertainty of 4.1 parts per billion. And now we know that we've rounded correctly on our X value, that we've got tenths place. Um, and so our reported value, if we're just showing plus or minus S, would be 129.9 plus or minus 4.1 parts per billion. And it does capture the 125, which is kind of nice, right? So it's uh, if you take 129.9 and subtract 4.1, you know, what do you get? 4.8, 124.8. And so we're pretty good, okay? Um, or 125.8, which just barely misses, actually. But it's, uh, it's pretty good. Now, when we go through this example, we'll see three different ways to calibrate, and, and it's, it's quite, a, quite a long ex example. So that's coming up in a couple of days. But here we are. We've propagated the uncertainty for our calibration example, and I just want to pause here to make sure that, that everybody would be able to do this on their own. Because when things pop up on the screen, it's pretty easy to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That making sense when you see it done for you is not the same as you knowing it. So where would you have gotten tripped up if you were doing this problem? It's okay to share with friends. Mm -hmm. Probably the first term for the first squared why we actually did S rather than this one here? Um, this one? No, the other one. This one? Yeah. Okay, so this is this is um, I guess a starred term. You know, that's one of the ones that you would say, what is what value is that? What what goes there, right? Um, <clears throat> if you were to just try to figure it out on your own, what would you have put there? It's pretty clear in this in this subtract I mean in this division here that that M is one of them. So this one is pretty obvious, right? Okay, but this one is the one that's confusing. Right, and and so I've seen many times when I'm grading these that people would just put B over SB in there, or Y over S Y or S Y over Y or S B over B. They'll just pick one of those. Um, sometimes, let's say you just have one Y value, and so you you know you you don't have S Y, and so then you may get lucky and just do S B over B. And, and get it, but the problem is it's not the relative standard deviation of B, it's the relative standard deviation of the difference between Y and B. So even then, you're going to be dramatically off, because notice that this value here in the numerator is not B. Not <laughs> B. It's this, it's the difference. And so that can really throw the numbers off if you, if you do this wrong. And so you can just be, your uncertainty can just be completely wrong. Okay. And that means your confidence intervals are completely wrong. 
and they could be wrong in the wrong direction. They could be overly narrow. And, you know, you get 129.9 parts per billion plus or minus 0.01. And you're like, ooh, wow, I've got a really precise measurement here. And now I've got a problem because my check sample was 125, but I think I'm certain to the hundredth place in parts per billion. So there's a bias in my experiment somehow. I've got, I've got, a, I've got a, what we call a systematic error. Something about my procedure is off every time because I'm precise, but I'm wrong. And that means I've got a bad pipette, I've got a bad balance, I've got a bad instrument that's, that's giving me the same drift every time, but it's off somehow. And you can imagine that that would send you down a, a rabbit trail chasing things that don't exist. And when you start changing things that are working correctly, you have a high probability of making them work worse. And so it's really bad to chase down troubles that don't exist because of a mathematical error. Okay, so this is another example of why this is really important. So the RSD is, is, is an important factor. It's, again, it's the uncertainty divided by the, the, um, the size of your measurement. Another way of kind of thinking about the noise over the signal. Um, um, we'll take a Kahoot here in a second, and we can we can look at some of those values. Uh, anything strike you about this example? Anything? Uh, any f further comments before we move on? Is this uh, you like this better than the density example? This is kind of a new example this year. The density one is good, but I think this is more relevant because you're going to do calibrations. Okay, so let's move on to the Kahoot. So you pull out your devices. This is really kind of a review, Kahoot, it goes back to previous um, lectures. Okay, five four five seven two eight, and remember to use your login ID, the ABC one two three, so I can tell who who took it. We got the sound today. That's nice. If anybody doesn't have a device today and they want to just make sure they get registered, go ahead and sign after class. Put your initials down. Okay. Everybody in that's playing? Oh, okay. <laughs> just make sure. <laughs> it was such a long pause, I thought everybody was done. Okay. Yeah, okay. Room for one more. 24 people. You wait? Want me to wait? Are you in? No. Okay. All right, let's get started. <coughs> so why would you use the sample standard deviation instead of this population sigma for a small data set? Really two answers that were correct. Um, what do we mean by conservative estimate? What is that? Is this about politics? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of answered in the red one. Because S is dividing by N minus 1 in, in, that, in that equation, it's, it's a little bit larger. It's dividing by a smaller number, so it's a little bit larger. And that's called a conservative estimate. Because what are we what are we 
telling someone when we share our 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 standard deviations. Yeah, our uncertainty, and it's conservative to give them a bigger value, right? To say, look, I'm I'm pretty sure it's between these two limits. I'm going to give you the largest limits, the worst case. That's a that's a conservative estimate of your uncertainty. You don't want to don't want to overclaim by by making it as narrow as possible. You're kind of overclaiming, and you might be wrong. You don't want to be wrong, so you want to be conservative in your estimation. Which of these certainties is largest relative to the mean? Now, there's kind of some wonky answers in here, so don't be confused by some. Wow, okay. They were confused. Go with the one you're most sure of, even if you don't understand the others. You better hurry. <laughs> Yay, okay. When push comes to shove, you chose the right one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so CV, we didn't really talk much about that. It's called coefficient of variation, and it's just the RSD times 100%, or if it's a really, really small number times some some value that makes sense. Uh, percent is, is parts per 100. If it's a really, really small number, uh, then you can do parts per million, parts per billion. Okay, those are all the kind of the same thing. We'll, we'll talk about that some more. But CV is sort of the relative standard deviation times uh, some part per million or part per hundred. So most of the time it's percent. Uh, and then this one is not multiplied by 100%. This is just 0.75. So if I wanted to convert this to CV, I'd multiply that by uh, uh, by 100% and I get 75%. So this would be a CV of 75%, this is 35%, and this is parts per million. So that, that's a very, very tiny percent. Okay, so that'd be point, uh, oh, oh, like four zeros and a five six percent. Yeah. All right, so let's go to the next one. So the needle is exactly between two tick marks, labeled seven and eight. What do you write down? <laughs> Yay, I'm glad to see that, yes. The eight thing can confuse engineers sometimes, okay? The, the rounding rules at 0.5, uh, some are really particular, and they'll look at the next digit, and if it's even, they round down, if it's odd, they round up. So at 0.5, they'll, they'll split it 50-50, and that's kind of strange, I've never done that, but you know, they say that it incorporates that one little bit of bias if you always round up at 0.5. Last question. When the precision of multiple groups is being reported, use the blank. So here's four different standard deviation labels. Which one would you use? Yay, okay. So this ties into our measurement exercise we did last time. And we wanted to m report the, the on precision of the whole room, we would use the pooled standard deviation. Okay. And we'd make sure everybody would use the same units. <laughs> Probably the same ruler, too, please. Yeah. So, great job. Okay. Yay. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about those confidence intervals. So again, our, our measurement process has lots of little random errors. If you know what the error is, it's not random. That's called a special cause variation. And your control chart exercise is looking for special cause variation. You have to train yourself or you're, you're, you have to yeah, train yourself when you're observing the data for 15 days to understand what the normal variation is and then when something special happens, something non-random, you'll be able to identify it. Okay. 
So you've got to learn what the random variations give you. How wide is your distribution? And that will tell you then if something special happened. Now occasionally, during the training period, uh, people are unlucky enough to have a special cause in the training period. Okay, so you're going along and then this data point throws things off. If that happens to you, we'll visit about it to see, you know, what, what makes sense. You can take the, the uh, um, data point, you've got the standard deviation of all your data, and then you can take that with that data point and then do what's called a Grubbs test, which we'll get into probably the next lecture, and throw it out if it's below 2.5% probability of that data point being in that population. Okay, and so you're saying, this is a special cause, I'm not going to use that as part of my training set. And so, you know, your seventh data point or whatever may be completely off, but then you track it for another seven days or so, and then you say, yeah, it was totally off, and it shouldn't be part of the standard deviation that I use to track that process for the next two months. When I said, is it less than 2.5%, y'all already saw with that metal example that if it's out in the wings, then, you know, what's the chance of it being within that Gaussian distribution? Uh, if it's, the, you know, above this plus or minus 2 sigma, if it's up here, this is less than 2.5% chance right at that mark. If it's way out here, it may be, you know, one part in a million chance that it would be there if it was part of this data set. It could still be just random variation, but it's unlikely. That means one chance in a million that random variation would give you that data point. You know, it's, it's still possible, right? Just like the sad guy, he's like, will you go out with me? And she goes, there's not one chance in a million I'd go out with you. And he goes, so you're saying it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, but it's not probable. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you've got the normal variation here. And where does it lie relative to the mean and the standard deviation? So that's when we're talking about confidence intervals, we're talking about the area under this normally distributed curve, which would capture the random variations in the data. And plus or minus 2 sigma gives you 95.4% coverage. Well, if you don't like that 0.4, then don't use plus or minus 2 sigma, use 1.96. And so 1.96 sigma plus or minus gives you 95% confidence. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a range of values that is likely to contain the true value. So you... Uh, for that metal example, we measure the density and we get our values there and we're saying the true identity of this metal is somewhere between these limits. And if we put the 95% confidence limits in there, then we're 95% sure it's somewhere in the middle of those. That's why we could say it's 95% confident it's not magnesium because magnesium was outside of that limit. Okay. It does mean that there's a, there's a, you know, one out of 20 you might get a measurement that's outside of that limit. Because there's still a 5% chance that, it would, that the true value is outside that limit. Okay. <clears throat> and so then let's look at the tables that we use to get these confidence levels. Uh, if we're using um, single measurements, okay, this, I'm going to change this in the notes. Uh, this is for population. I'm going to scratch out this piece right here okay okay so use this one for a population and for a nova so if we get our values from our you know our standard deviation and our mean using an a nova table we've got the full model of our uncertainty <coughs> And so we can just use Z times sigma. When I said that 95% confidence, here's that value. 95% confidence, Z is equal to 1.96. And these T values approach Z as N gets larger and larger and larger. Okay. So if we did, um, if we just did, uh, say, three titrations, and we did the mean and standard deviation. In order to get 95% confidence, 
we have to multiply our uncertainty value, here's T, by 3.182. And here's our standard deviation, and we would divide by the square root of 3. Okay, so that's if you just do three measurements, um, direct measurements, three masses, three titrations, uh, three volume measurements, you could get a 95% confidence interval. But because you've only done three, we want to be conservative, and so we multiply that standard deviation by three, and then we divide by the square root of three. So it pushes it out quite a bit. <clears throat> now, we'll talk about Six Sigma quality today, too, and that's, uh, um, that's six standard deviations, okay? And, and so what you want to do, uh, we'll talk about how that's used in the automotive in industry, and, and I think we want to move forensics towards that type of quality uh, exercise. These are the Excel formulas, too, down at the bottom um, that give you the values in these tables. And so you can look up these values in tables, or you can use the formulas that generate them. And so that's, I like to use the formulas. So we might think that 95% confidence is great. 99% confidence is even better, but even that stinks if you're just doing one measurement. So that's why in forensics, we have uh, three techniques coupled together. So it has to be identified as a drug, say a, sub, uh, a controlled substance by like a spot test and an FTIR and a GC. So the chances of getting through that, let's say we're operating all of those at 95% confidence, it's 0.05 chance of getting past the first one, incorrect, times 0.05 for the second, times 0.05 for the third. So that false positive rate would be 0.05 times 0.05 times 0.05. And that's way better than just one value of 0.05. Instead of 5% chance, it's, can you, let me just do it on my calculator here. 0.05 cubed. <clears throat> now spot type, spot tests are hard to quantify um, in terms of confidence interval because it's just a color change. But you could do, give somebody a whole bunch of samples and have them test them and see what their error rate is. And you'd want their error rate to be less than 5%. Okay, so 0 0.05. Yeah, so it's... 0 0.000125. So that would be the, the um, <laughs> that would be the probability of a false positive. If you had three 95% confidence measurements uh, linked together like that. But if you're just operating one instrument, one measurement, um, and you know want to know what the error rate is at 99% confidence, that's 20,000 lost articles of mail per hour. That's so we need to operate our mail at better than 99% confidence. Unsafe drinking water 15 minutes a day, 5,000 incorrect surgical operations a week. Yeah, they happen, but I don't think they happen that often. You know, they, and doctors are, you know, good doctors are very, um, what do I want to say, very open about making sure they do things the right way. They were uh, replacing a friend of ours, they, she was having her knee replaced, and. He went in with the doctor and he said, this is the one, right? And talking to her before she was under. And he goes, okay, so he got a shark eye, And he said, this one. Because, <laughs> you know, he's, an, uh, he's a surgeon. They're bringing bodies in. He's replacing knees. And they bring another one. He replaces the knee. You want to want to replace the wrong knee, <laughs> right? And so he's got a big Sharpie mark on there. Do not replace the other one. <clears throat> then short and long landings, not good. 200,000 incorrectly filled prescriptions. That's bad. Uh, no electricity. Or with murders, 16,204 murders. This was in 2008, quite a while ago. This would be 162 wrongful convictions mm -hmm. for murder. No, it's not. Because <laughs> you do, you know, dang, that's bad. So we need to operate it better than 99% confidence. We need to have at least 99% confidence, ideally, on three different techniques that are not linked to each other.
what would be an example of a linked technique? Okay, say a mass spectrum where you had the molecular ion and a fragment. Okay, and try to count that as two techniques. No, it's still just one technique. It's one phenomenon. It's it's the molecule being ionized and going through the mass spec and being detected. So you really couldn't count that as two technique. It might bolster your, your single technique to say, yeah, we've got the molecular ion and we've got this particular um, fraction or fragment that still confirms that that's the right one, but that still wouldn't count as two techniques. That would be one technique. But retention time is different than mass spec, totally different phenomenon. So retention time would be one technique and the ionization pattern would be a second technique. So GCMS can count as two techniques because the, the time it takes to get to the column is substantially a different process than the ionization and fragmentation patterns. <clears throat> so <clears throat> ideally, if we had a six sigma quality, then that would be less than 4.3 defects per million opportunities. And so in that case, we would have zero wrongful convictions if we had 116,000 murders. Okay. Because we would have to have, say, a million murders for 4.3 wrongful convictions. So four convictions uh, wrongfully out of a million opportunities. And actually, this is per million opportunities, not per million, like in automobiles. This isn't a million automobiles have four defects. This is per million opportunities on an automobile. So there's probably going to be a defect in every automobile. But they want it to be less than four defects per million opportunities. There's four wheels, there's eight lug nuts on each wheel, and all these different things. There's a million opportunities for things to go wrong. They want less than four of those opportunities to be an error. And so you can say, well, gee, in a, in, a, in a conviction, there may be a million opportunities, all the little pieces of evidence. And there may be four of those that are wrong. But is that enough to throw the whole process off? Probably not. You know, having a little uh, defect in a little tiny opportunity on a car is not going to make the car not run. Okay, and just like in a case, you might have one piece of evidence that's a little off, but you have other pieces of evidence that are on, and so you still get the correct result, but not everything's perfect. But this is as close to perfect as, as uh, engineers are willing to try to get to. In, in high quality operations. So what this means is, <clears throat> if this is our measurement here in the middle, then you've got one sigma, you know, two sigma, and you go all the way out here, six sigma to the upper specification limit or the lower specification limit. Think about how narrow your, your process has to be. Let's say this upper specification limit would be, on this side, it's a controlled substance, right? And you want the and you measure something here. You want there to be less than one part per million, or four actually four parts per million here, this area under the curve, so that you're getting a false positive for a controlled substance. You see how how safe that is. You know they test it. They know it's it's not a controlled substance, and they can say confidently there's less than a four chance in a million that that, that it is. Or let's say it is. And you, you measure this, now it's a controlled substance here in the middle, and then this is your, your not, you know, so not a controlled substance. So you just sort of, where's your measurement and its uncertainty relative to where you're going to have to make a judgment? And you want to be far away from that line. <clears throat> this figures into uh, detection limits. So when do you say the signal in your instrument is strong enough to say, yeah, that's real? Do you think, you see what I'm saying? You run a blank. You got a, a signal. You run another blank, you got a signal. You run three blanks, you've got a signal. Now you've got some standard deviation. You can average those. When do you say the signal's strong enough that it's real, it's not noise? Plus three sigma. So whatever your blank is, three times the standard deviation of the blank is your limit of detection. <coughs> And we'll cover this some more later, but I just want to, if you want to write it down now, that's fine, because if it means something to you. So your limit of detection, <clears throat> this is rule of thumb. There's, there's more advanced ways to do this, but um, <clears throat> so 
That's when you're saying, I detected something real. What about quantification? When you're, when you're saying, okay, not only is it real, but I can tell you how much is there. Right? This is just saying, okay, that signal is real. But if I were to try to tell you that, that it's uh, you know, two parts per million, I would have really wide error bars because I'm so close to my noise. And it would be 10. So limit of quantitation. So that's pretty good. You've got the uncertainty in your blank, and you're taking that standard deviation, and you're multiplying it by 10. And then way up there, 10 times the uncertainty in your blank, you're saying, okay, now I feel comfortable telling you how much is there. Okay. And so this is detection <coughs> and quantitation. Okay, so limit of detection, limit of connotation. Uh, these are just simple rules. Like I said, the, in the uh, Guide for Uncertainty Management, the GUM, it's a document that I have on Blackboard. You can go in and I'll have more advanced formulas for these. But I look in the literature too and you'll just see people using these because it's a good conservative estimate of uh, when you can say you've detected something and when you can say that you can quantify it. Okay. Sometimes instrument companies uh, will, will uh, try to brag and say, you know, how small their levels that they can detect. And they'll say that, you know, we have a limit of detection at, at uh, say, seven parts per trillion. Okay, really, really low. Um, and then the sad thing is sometimes there be legislators that try to control, say, arsenic down to the limit of detection for, for ICPMS. And so they're, they're trying to tighten it so far down that the, the analysts can't be confident that they're quantifying down to that level. Okay. And so that happened, um, it was a couple of presidents ago where they, as one president went out of office, I think it was Bill Clinton, he lowered the arsenic standard for drinking water down to close to the limit of detection. And uh, it wasn't an instrumental issue, it was an like natural water issue. No, it was release. It was a uh, arsenic standard for releasing water and wastewater in Borger, Texas, I know this because I was up there, Borger, Texas uh, drinking water standard had a higher allowance for arsenic than their emission, like release standard. And so they could drink the arsenic, but they couldn't release it from the sewer plant. So the arsenic went through everybody, and then they were at the sewer plant, and they couldn't release the water because it had too high arsenic because the standards were opposite of each other. And so really what it was was just like, okay, my next, the next president comes in, they're going to have to raise the arsenic standard for release, and it's going to be a political football. And they're like, oh, this president doesn't like the environment because they're raising the arsenic standard. It was like, no, it was sort of just like a kick somebody in the pants when they come in. <laughs> but, but it's a problem when they try to control things down to the limit of detection. Why is that? Well, because you can't, be quant you can't quantify it with... Uh, with any kind of certainty. I mean, you're just barely, you know, you're only three standard deviations above your blank level. And that's not good enough to be confident. Uh, you know, 10 sigma above your blank is way better than six sigma. I mean, what you're saying is I'm so confident it's not my noise that I can now quantify. Here in the last five minutes or so, are there any questions about the, the assignment, the control chart assignment? Everybody, I need to look at them this weekend, look at the reports and make sure, but you should be collecting data. Okay, so go ahead and do that. Um, anything come to mind on your, on your control charts? The homework's, uh, let's see, Thursday, uh, homework's due tonight, um, five pages. Uh, some people have commented on the problems that are listed from the previous book, and there was a figure in there. I went ahead and added a figure uh, that you can use to answer that problem number four. I think it was in chapter four. Uh, don't forget the practice exams, too. 
So look at those practice exams. Don't just write out the question and then circle the answer. You won't get any points for that. Uh, I want you to say why that answer is right. Okay. So when, um, you know, if there's a vocabulary word in there, you can then right there put vocabulary words in. But I want to see more than just because that's just busy work. I'm not asking you to just complete five pages. I'm asking you to study. Okay, and just trying to dictate to your pages things off the practice exam and get credit for that, that's not learning, that's just busy work. And I'm not trying to give you busy work for five pages a week. I'm trying to say there's a discipline of doing work each day of the week, you know, instead of cramming it all up. Since there's only three exams in this course, um, the, the tendency to cram is huge, right? Oh, I don't have an exam for another three weeks, so I'm not going to do any homework. Well, that's the point of the five pages and the control chart exercise, so that you stay in the material every week, and so then you don't cram at the end, and you'll do better, and you'll remember it later. All right, that's good. See you next time.